Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to share my story. And so I'm here to talk to you today, and this is the title of my talk, which I'll get into later. This is a quote that was said to me when I was in graduate school. It's quite offensive to me, to be said to me, but I'll tell you what happened. Um, I'll tell you what happened after that was said. So, so just to tell you where I'm from, this beautiful place called Madison, Wisconsin. There's my lab. If anyone's from Madison, please just shout out there. There you go. So I just want to thank my success is based on my student success. And if you notice there, the minority in my group in my lab is actually a German woman. So we have seven out of eight of my lab as of this summer was underrepresented. A lot of you think Wisconsin doesn't have success in this area. I'm making success. So I'm going to talk to you today about a few things. This is just a small snippet of my story. I have 30 minutes to tell you little bits of my life. I'm going to start with my family, part because that's of where I come from. So being a geneticist, the first thing I need to tell you about is my genetics, right? And if, you know, if people who know me know my personality, my father, that is me. I am my father. He is a crazy guy, right? So my father was an art educator, a sculptor, and he's Ukrainian. That's where I get my name. And my mother was Eastern Band, Cherokee, and also Lebanese. Very unusual, but this is America, right? Both art educators, right? So who did they give birth to, right? All these artists, except for this scientist. How did this occur? My father was in, you, unusual in the case is that he worked as a medical illustrator. And he taught anatomy. And people thought that was crazy at the time, too, as well. But when I grew up in this family, I, know no, I knew no difference between art and science. That was, it was in tune with that. And I'll share you some of these examples of where that was in tune in my life. And as I got older, I realized people thought they were different, but I was very similar. I'd also like to point out is that I am the lowest paid person in my family. My brothers and sisters are artists. They triple my salary, very successful. So if you're still interested in art, you can make more than a scientist. So here's a picture of my father in our basement in our studio. He's sculpting his, um, my dad would played football and also was an art major, sculptor. He's doing the bust of his, of his football coach, Ben Schwarzwalder of Syracuse. And so this, this portrait and this room in here was very integral to my life, watching my dad uh, sculpt busts and huge sculptures. My dad also can do just about everything, charcoal. This is a self-portrait of my father. Um, the other things that happen in my life is my dad often consulted on different projects that not necessarily you would think be related to art but, and science, but he did. So being in the case of being here in Los Angeles, I thought I'd share this one story. So most of you who know King Kong and Jaws, and so this happened in the early 70s when I was born. So one of his classmates, Don Chandler, was the sculptor for, for King Kong and Jaws. And my dad was pulled in as a consultant to create the armature and the structure, and he worked with scientists and the, robot, the robotics people and the engineers to, to create this thing that became King Kong and very famous. And that was, you know, we were meeting uh, movie directors coming into our house. And so my dad, you know, this was such a small part. But it, it, was, it was, I knew that in the arts there was a need for science and both for the making new discoveries. So I'll share you, um, in addition to having the studio in the house, my, my father had students from all over the world coming to live with us. So here's a picture in the 70s. There's a picture of me up there. I think I'm two years old at that point, right? Looks like a bunch of hippies. Yeah, there's a lot. There's artists, musicians, philosophers. All these people were my mentors as a child. And they made me who I am. My mother's up there in the top right, probably pregnant with my sister. Um, so very successful people, people who, who changed my diapers, obviously, too in addition to that, but they were very integral to part of my life to understand, to broaden horizons, and to do what you can. I was always in the studio with my father. I grew up in a very unusual home in, in, in Kentucky. This is a historic site in Kentucky now. 
But I want to tell you, I didn't grow up in privilege. This is a, a perfect example of the power of networking. I asked my father, how much did you make as an art professor with the four kids? And he says, $11,000 a year. You know, that's what we grew up with, well, not much money. So my father was very good at networking, and he ran into this artist, Julian Bechtold. And Julian was, was very aged, and he wanted someone to maintain the home. And so when we were about seven, we moved into this home, and we maintained it. And so this became this living museum. And so we got this home for free. So I grew up in a, a free home with no mortgage, but it was because of the networking that I had. So all of you in Sockness, networking does work, and it can put a roof over your head. This house is also significant for many people who know about Procter & Gamble products. So the very first ivory soap bar was carved in my home. So the Julian Bechtold was involved in the integral part of packaging, right? Soap is actually a chemical compound, right? So how do you package it for the public? You need an artist to do that. So the first ivory soap bar was done in my home here. My, my father took care of the grounds and put his own artwork, and I'll show you an example of that. There's sculptures in the back, and there's gardens and all that stuff. And what I want to point out here is that my father, and you'll see throughout my talk, was very, was very keen on showing me quotes that were inspirational. And here's one that he actually put on the grounds of the home, and that is, every child is an artist. The problem is, how do you remain that when you grow up? And so when I left for college and for graduate school, he says, a child always is exploring and, ch and trying new things and all that kind of stuff. These are things I use today as a scientist, maintaining that childlike viewpoint on what I see. I'm non-biased. I don't think about that stuff. And that was something he told me. We grew up with this quote, very inspirational for me, right? Coming from Picasso, famous artist, right? So I'm going to skip on to graduate school. And this is where the title of my talk comes into importance. So when I, jo I joined a lab, I was there for two years, and my mentor at the time said to me, you know what, I think you're too creative for science. I thought I was like deer in a headlights. What the heck, right? So I left lab for two days. I was terribly offended because of my background. I called my father and he said, well, you see these kinds of people at universities. Just find something, so I, find another mentor. So I thought about it, but I, I really wanted to see, was this comment actually true? And so I did a lot of research, and I came up with probably obvious choices that you probably know about. Was Leonardo da Vinci too creative for science? He's the, you know, one of the first well-known science artists. He's also dyslexic like me. He's left-handed like me. Was he too creative for science? Well, I mean, look, think of all the inventions that he had. I ran into another amazing scientist, Ernst Haeckel. He's probably, these drawings are just unbelievable. I was astounded by the detail, all right? This is before video microscopy. You know, you had to draw absolute every detail to convince and communicate your scientific ideas to the public and to other scientists. And he's one of the earlier adopters of Darwin's theory of evolution. He drew similar species and convinced the public that we, they come from a common ancestor. The, here's pictures of, you know, these are mushrooms and fungi that he grew. Unbelievable images. If you're really into it, I highly recommend you look at that. Many of you also probably know, and I ran into Rosalind Franklin, right? Here was another case where visualization was really important for scientific discovery. Right, the X-ray diffraction image, right? Look at that image, it's two-dimensional. But what happened in the collaboration with Watson and Crick, Watson and Crick said, let me see what I can do with that, right? What did they do? Just like an artist, they took that visualization and they built a sculpture out of this image. And their ideas that they saw from that two-dimensional image became more obvious, right? Everyone always builds off of discoveries that other people have made and they made them wonderful, right? Here's the sculpture, famous sculpture, right? And more recently, I've found many of my contemporaries, and I often have scientific crushes. One of my scientific crushes is a mathematician at MIT, Eric Domain, at the age of 17, had solved an old mathematical problem with the use of art. 
and origami. Many of you probably know that. He's also came very similar path as I, came from a family of artists. How did, was he able to do that? He had no boundaries. There was no boundaries as a child. And he's really great and has a lot of art shows as well. He's really showed us that math is really beautiful. And on the bottom of the slide there, he, a recent nature, no, a recent science paper has actually showed that you can make robots from flat sheets of plastic assemble through origami-like origami um, folding and walk away. So I encourage you to go look at that. He's one of my scientific idols, and, very, and still he's, he's 33 years old and has made unbelievable advances to a lot of different fields by using art, right? So I just want to leave you with that this part is, is that scientists, all these people have developed ideas that were new and useful and built on previous work which is the very def definition of creativity, right? Things that are new and useful are important, right? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my science. So what, my undergraduate lab, I worked on RNA splicing. I still don't understand it. I was very, this was the first day in my lab, I was like, oh my gosh, what the heck is this? Many of you probably know it's a DNA gel, right? But to me, this wasn't biology. I couldn't see things moving. From an artist background, it was very hard for me to grasp concept of this completely esoteric thing called the DNA gel, all right? Still, every, every time I hear the word RNA splicing, I get this little buzz in my head, and this is the visual. And I go, oh, I don't, still don't know what it is. So, but I stumbled upon a developmental cell biology book in my course, and I saw this, and I was like, hold the, stop the train. This, to me, was a Picasso. It was something that completely changed my life. This is a cell in mitosis, in prophase, just as it goes into, metaf just as it goes into metaphase, and I had never seen anything like this before. And it, it's for me is that the beauty is defining my curiosity, and I wanted to figure out how that was going to work. And so I decided mo all my life, I want to study this process of mitosis based on the fact of the beauty. And it has kept me in science ever since. So just a little bit about my work is I work on cell polarity. How do you put your head where your head is and your feet where your feet is, right? It's really important in development right after fertilization. And then how, once you do that, how do you divide up the cell? And so we know that errors in this, in this, in this event actually cause cancer, and we know in as you age, your neurons in your brain actually become multinucleate and has many implications in aging, neurological disorders such as Parkinson and ALS. And these are the things that I'm working on in my lab. So before, as a student, I decided I wanted to, what is the real question that's unknown in the field? Well, who is the first person to look at this event? And so, of course, being from an art background, I went to the, try to find the oldest person who's ever looked at this event. So I stumbled upon this paper, 1891. Again, an artist, scientist, Walter Fleming. He actually discovered mitosis. And he said at the time, and the, yellow, and the red arrows are actually showing a little structure called the midbody, which has become the source of all of my life. <laughs> and so the midbody is this structure that he thought it was really important for animal cell division. Yet, no one paid attention to this work in 1891. People picked it up in the 1960s, maybe you know, 50s, 60s, little few papers here and there. And by the time I started graduate school, people said, this is the garbage can of the cell. It's so unimportant, no one really cares. Right? I said, great, I'll work on it. Right? So, so what I did as a postdoc is I decided to study and isolate the structure called the midbody. I used proteomics and genomics to identify over 100 new proteins involved in division. I got the cover of science, which I'm more proud of than actually the work. So I got the, the cover of science. So having the cover of science on something people thought was garbage is pretty, uh, I sat myself on the back there, you know, I think. A lot of people thought that I would not succeed and I had very unsuccessful postdoc. 
And, but I stuck it out because I had the passion for it. I knew that that's what I wanted to do, and I didn't care what everyone said. It was, it was part of my curiosity, right? Again, the beauty sort of instilling my curiosity. Here's these beautiful mid-bodies if you isolate them from these Cho cells. So there's those two cells dividing there. We isolate them biochemically. So what my lab is doing now is try to I understand how these proteins are actually functioning in the cell. We go from the mammalian cells and include them and look at them in C. elegans. We do that partially for many reasons because the cell cycle is very rapid, which I'll show you. Um, our animals are transparent, and we can use this beautiful thing called GFP to actually tag what the proteins do. So I'm going to share with you my beautiful organism. It's going to crawl across the slide here. There's my worm. So we cut the worm in half, and then we make a video of it. So here's the video of fertilization. Egg and sperm are meeting here, and you're watching the division. I can watch this a million times. It never gets old. It's absolutely gorgeous, right? And look, if you look at the top at the timestamp, it's very rapid. And so human cells actually take 24 hours to divide, right? Of course, we can't use human cells to do that. So we use the C. elegans embryo to look at that, those events. Very rapid, very advanced. And so the next thing we do is we take GFP and we tag them on the proteins and we look at that. But I'm going to show you a wild-type embryo with the same kind of thing, but we're tagging the plasma membrane and the nucleus so we can look at the mitotic events. And when we knock out genes, we can actually see what goes wrong in these, in these embryos as they're dividing. So that helps us understand, is that protein required for the mitotic event? And is that showing the phenotypes we expect? So that's what my lab does. I'm not going to bore you with the minutia of the details. And so I'm going to move on to how my art has inspired my teaching, how my background has, and I'm really a proponent of changing the way science is, is is taught in the schools. This is really important to me. So one of the things I've noticed, and I, a lot of you students out there, I, have, I failed my prelim twice, right? Still here, right? I'm still here. And I think the, one of the greatest quotes to actually highlight that is this Einstein quote. The only thing that interferes with my learning is my education. <laughs> and that's a case for me, right? And many of you probably know the next quote, Sir Ken Robinson, right? The education system is educating people out of their creativity, right? In the background, you have your Scantron sheet, right? I tell my students on the first day, do you think I come to work every day and fill out bubble sheets? No, I don't. That's like the least creative thing to do. So why do we teach it? Why do we use that way of assessment in the classroom? So I went back to my background to think about this problem. And how, how do I teach this better, right? Here's a picture of people sitting in a museum. How many people have been to an art museum? How many people think after they've been to the art museum, they actually know that they're an artist? Probably <laughs> some people might think that, yeah? But like I grew up in my household, you really had to do it. I mean, you had to get your hands in the clay and really understand what you were using, and express yourself in that way. I knew that as a child was important. However, when I got to school, I got this, right? I got this museum where I was just there for a bit. I did, couldn't touch anything, couldn't do anything. But this is the same as the studio. The lab is the studio. That's where you get your hands dirty. That's where you make mistakes. That's where you change. That's where you make discoveries. Same exact thing as an artist. So I've completely changed and created courses that is 100% active learning. And I'll share you one example, and you can go to my website. So I teach a gene and disease model. I teach genomics for undergrads, capstone course, junior and senior. And I tell them to pick a gene and a disease that interests them, mostly a disease that interests them. Many of them pick things that are very meaningful to them. The example I'm going to chose, choose, so a student came to me, he says, Baldness runs in my family. Great. Let's find the gene, right? So this is their website. So they have a published material at the end of the semester about the research they're finding about this, this gene and this disease, and they defend their ideas. I don't lecture. The students lecture themselves. I facilitate things, completely 100% the students. A lot of students fight me on it. And at the end of the semester, they say, 
I never would have thought I have learned as much without you in the front of the room. I said, great. You know? And a lot of them say they never learned as much in a course ever. But they did it. You know, this is my art background. They were in the studio playing around, making mistakes, coming up with their own ideas, most importantly. And that's what I really want to you know, nourish in, the, in STEM education, is to actually nourish those new ideas. And all of you out there have these ideas because of who you are and where you come from. So I'm going to next move on and give you examples of what I've done in public outreach. So as all of you and people who know about NSF, is that the broader impacts are really important. And for me, this is equally important. And someone with a visual background, even doubly, doubly so, how can I engage the public to understand why my science is important, what it's about? And I became keenly aware when I was a student that there is very little on the tree of life that we can see. You know, there's only a few things we could see with the naked eye. I don't, what does it look like? I don't know. There are there things that I don't know how, what, the, what is the mechanism, all these kinds of things. This was sort of the impetus of that. I wanted to share my science background and the things that I see under the microscope with the public. And given that I, I set up tons of art shows over the years, I thought, well, this was easy. So in 1997, I was in the third year of my graduate program. I started the C. Elegans Art Show. Yes, quite, quite obscure art show at the International C. Elegans meeting. I started, I asked my advisor, John White, who is a microscopist, I said, I'd like to do this. He says, great idea, I don't have time, do it yourself. So I did, so I did it. People in my lab were like, I don't know why you're wasting your time. This has nothing to do with your scientific career. I'm like, well, I really don't give a shit, obviously. <laughs> I'm just gonna do it. So now, after 17 years, it's an ongoing event. It's been written up in science, you know, and the scientists all over the place. And I'd have to say a note to students, keep doing what you're doing and what you're passionate about. So when I went on the job market, I applied to 15 places. I got 11 interviews, and every single person introduced me as the speaker, as the, the woman who does the art shows but also does fantastic science. So that, to me, was my marketing. You know, people saw me that I was engaging the public. It's also a good sign that you're a good teacher. You, you're engaging, right? So I'm going to show you some examples from this show. A lot of people were skeptical. So these are scientists from, you know, these are your colleagues, people out there, things that you don't think is going on behind the scenes. This is not all of my work. This is scientists. So it's a testament to the creativity in science. So this was one of my first place winner. So Stephen Johnson is at Brigham Young now. This is a stained glass C. elegans, right? If you're a C. elegans fan, you're like, holy shit, right? <laughs> this is amazing, right? Next entry, right? A batik C. elegans, wow, you know? Like, people were really into this. I was really surprised. And everyone who knows Andy Warhol, right? So if you look at EM images, right? Someone obviously was inspired there to make Marilyn Monroe into a C. elegans, right? It's really good. And probably one of my, as a postdoc, probably one of my first actually HHMI investigators, Abby Dernberg, who's now at Berkeley, this is her beautiful gonad. It's not her gonad, but it's the worm gonad, and these are nuclei stained, right? Beautiful, absolutely beautiful image, and it's just unbelievable. Here's the, the next image I'm going to show you something I did. So a lot of days when you're on the microscope, you look down and you're like, oh, crap, the experiment didn't work. But look at this image, right? This was one of them. So you can see my wor little worm crawling around there. Looks very celestial. Was, does anyone know what the, they think those UFO-looking things are? All right. Very unusual. These are actually air bubbles caught in the agar when it solidifies. It was stunning, right? It had to be the actual perfect temperature, time when the solidification was happening. You know, some days you look and you realize, wow, you know, I'm bigger than the worm here, but you know, you see the space and you just get overwhelmed. But these are things you can't share with the public when you, when you publish your paper, you know? So these are perfect examples of things to share with the public because people know what UFOs are. People know what water is, right? So that's an example there. So what I've done since I've become a faculty is had more chances to do other things. So I'm going to show you examples. Sort of the last part of my talk is some of the, 
the shows and installations I've done. So when I came to my campus, I was in a brand new, was fortunate to be in a brand new building. It was an empty wall. So I walked up to the dean's office above the head of my chair, and I said, I want to do this installation. He says, great, here's $15,000. I didn't have to write a grant. It was the easiest thing I ever done. This is what I did. This is inside my building. This is the work that people in my building do. Now we have tours of students coming in, seeing the beauty of science. This has led to a show, a touring show called Tiny, our show that was actually installed in the Madison Airport and is now traveling the country. It's been at the NSF. It's been in the Milwaukee Art Museum. Here's some examples of that. These are zinc oxide nano rods, absolutely beautiful. These are involved in making of solar cells. Here's a very iconic image that was in the New York Times, Sean Carroll in my department. This is a Drosophila embryo showing stripes of gene expression. Absolutely un unbelievable. You know, people see fruit flies on the bananas all the time, but no idea how beautiful it looks in the embryo, right? Here's another amazing image that I've shown a lot. This is probably something you probably feel all the time. So on the bottom of a leaf, it's very fuzzy, and you get this fuzzy feel. This is a trichome. It gives the fuzzy, it looks like it's from space. And recently, I had an opening. We had this cool science image competition on campus, and it's got a lot of sponsors set from corporate and we do these big shows. So that just opened up a month ago. And lastly, I want to give you an example of, I also, in addition to having the scientists in my lab, I actually have artists come to lab, oftentimes on Friday. So I had a Guggenheim fellow, and, and this is Chanel, and she is actually a performance artist, and she was in the lab every Friday looking at C. elegans. And the green there is she's actually showing the cuticle of the worm. She's also a fabric designer, and she took what she saw there and she made fabric out of it, something new from what she was looking at. So she's just unbelievable. Um, and would do these shows in New York with all this fabric she made from the C. elegance. Currently, I have another MFA student, Angela Johnson. We are actually have gotten approval to actually um, decorate all our, our floor with scientific art. And so it's going to be part of her MFA project. So I'm really supportive of the artists and scientists that are mingle. They come to lab meeting, they see what's going on, and we inspire each other. And one of the things I want to leave you with is that I'm not involved in all this art and science. I also do things outside of lab, and I have passions. So the things I do outside, one of them is I have a food blog. I have, these are very famous scientific cupcakes. So oftentimes when my students, or all the time when my students have a paper, we actually make a figure, cupcakes or cakes, out of the, one of the figures. So I tweeted this out, and this is the power of Twitter. I tweeted this picture out, and within three days, I had a job at Nature. They said, we like your point of view. So you can get a job with cupcakes. <laughs> so I want to I leave you with a few more quotes. And many of you probably know this. So Steve Jobs, right? The phone is, you needed art to actually make that sell, product sell. You know, that's all the science, but the art sold it. That was the genius there. And this quote is really great. It's really connecting things. Creativity is connecting things. But what he says down there in blue is that you don't get there. You don't get there unless your background, your background experiences make and, and put those two things together. And that's what's important. And most of all, especially for this conference, is that diversity is really the source of this creativity in education. All of you out there are, are different on the inside and on the outside, and that's what brings things new to the table, and that's why we want you in STEM. So hopefully, I've, through this talk, I've inspired you to actually be in the middle of this Venn diagram, to have that sense of wonder, and to be inspired by all of those things that make you curious about how it works. Thank you.